We got good news and we got bad news. The good news is we scored some more parts for the WRX. We got a full stock intake system. I got a full dash for like 20 bucks. Hopefully all the bulbs are good in that cluster. I'll just take the bulbs out of that and swap them in. And we also got the center clock piece, which I've been looking for forever because they are so hard to find. And the rest of the stock intake pieces are over here and they're in perfect shape. This is the triple gauge pod I hate in this car. All of the lights flicker, the coolant temp gauge doesn't even work it's not even hooked up to the coolant temp sensor at all the battery voltage gauge works but i just want to get rid of all of this because it's not even secured and i'm not going to show up but there is a rat's nest of wires in there the bad news is this thing still has more problems that we need to fix we got a couple leaks on this thing but it's not the engine thank god because i just resealed absolutely everything on this thing we got two coolant leaks hopefully you guys can see the two little puddles down there but we got one right here on this side and one on the left side back there right underneath the turbo and I know exactly where these leaks are coming from. And they should both be easy fixes. The first one that's on the right side of the engine, there is no way you guys are gonna be able to see it. But down inside of there, there's a coolant hose that comes off of the up pipe. You can kind of see it, but it's blurred out. That one's leaking a little bit. Then the other one that's leaking is the coolant hose right there that comes right off of the turbo. It just has one of those shitty factory spring clamps on it, and I'm pretty sure that's why it's leaking. Another issue that we have that kind of sucks is both of the bolt holes in the factory location for or the stock intake are completely busted. And I don't even know if that's a broken bolt inside of there or what the hell's going on with both of these. So we're gonna have to drill those out if we wanna install the stock intake. Another thing we gotta get done in today's video is we gotta get all of these wires pulled out of the engine bay through the firewall of the car. Because there's a subwire here that has no fuse on it, so that's sketchy on its own. And then we have a little hood switch wire that was going to this hood switch right here for the aftermarket remote start, which I'm probably gonna be pulling out of this thing. Last issue that we have outside of the car the rear coilovers on this thing are adjusted way too damn low so we got to raise them up i kind of want a two finger gap from the tire to the fender just because this thing is going to get driven in the snow a lot so right now in the front we got just under one finger so i'm going to raise up the fronts and the rears because in the rear this thing is tucked like this finger i can get up if i stick it straight up on the other side it is completely slammed i can't even get my finger in there then the right front is the same thing we got about one finger and while we're adjusting the coilovers i got a new set of e-brake shoes and a hardware kit for the back because mine are metal on metal. I just got a good old cheap Ray Vestas hardware kit, which has got the adjusters, the springs, everything I need. And then we also got a brand new set of e-brake shoes. So we gotta get those in. Last thing, I think, and we're gonna stick with I think because I'm probably gonna find more stuff wrong with this thing. On the interior of the car, now you guys can see those absolutely terrible gauges and my lights that are blue on one side and then green on the other side. The other problem on the inside of the car, none of the buttons work on the center car. Console. The mirrors, if I push the buttons, that mirror is not moving whatsoever. I'm moving it all around right now and it's not moving. And the driver's side is the same way. It doesn't move at all. Then I got these fresh steam cleaned new seats and none of my heated seat switches work. So we got to figure out what's going on here. They're not even lighting up. What? This trip piece just came. Oh my God, they're unplugged. The connectors aren't even plugged in. I have so many questions about this car. Why would you just not plug connectors back in? Connectors aren't even broken. Oh, they still don't work. Do the mirrors work? No. Oh my God. I don't have the key in the ignition. Now do they work? Hey, they light up. Whether the heated seats actually work, I don't know. Second piece to the puzzle. Let's see if the mirrors work now. Set her to the left, push the buttons. Hey, they work. Who the hell leaves their mirrors unplugged in heated seats? Does that side work? Hey, it does. Well, that was an easy fix. And you guys could see from here, the heated seat lights light up now. So those probably work too. I have a little temperature gun here. I'm gonna test and make sure that the bottom heated seat element is getting hot and that the one on the back is getting hot. So I'm gonna leave these heated seats on a high. These are rubbed out, but I think down is high. And then I'm gonna keep the temperature gun on this and see what it reads. Right now it's reading 13.6 degrees Celsius on the bottom. 
and on the top it's about 17 depending where I move it around. So I'm gonna let those heat up a bit and see what happens. The driver's seat I could already feel getting hot on my butt. This one's already at over 30 degrees. That could have been because I was just sitting in it and the back of it's at 28 degrees so I think that one's working. We'll wait for the passenger side to heat up a little bit more maybe because I could feel this one getting hot on my ass and on my back. Okay it's been heating up for about five minutes now and the bottom of the seat is still only 13 degrees Celsius. It has not changed but the back of the seat is reading like 22 degrees Celsius. So the back is working but the ass heater is not working. So on the driver's seat they're both working. On the passenger seat only the back is working. But we have good news. We still have one good WRX passenger seat left. I just got to clean that one up but we'll get to that later. The first thing that I really really want to get out of the way is the ride height and those e-brake shoes because that's definitely going to be the biggest job so let's just get her done. I think we're gonna have to go up about three inches in the back. Okay, we got the new e-brake shoes in and that was a pain in the ass. I am not looking forward to doing the other side. But while we're on this side, I'm gonna raise this coil over up by about two inches. And I'll show you guys the easiest way to measure and do that. I like to use a set of vernier calipers, just a set of digital ones, because you can measure the amount of thread you got there between lock collars, and then you can raise it up by two inches. That way you have an exact measurement and you can make it the same on both sides. So right now, you guys probably can't see it very well, but from lock collar to lock collar, I got about three inches of space. So I'm I'm gonna raise this coil over up until I got about five inches of space there. Okay, I ended up only going up an inch just to four inches because that took forever and I feel like two inches was a lot. So we'll start at an inch and if it's still too low, we can always raise it more. But we're at 4.005 inches right there. So now we can get the tire back on this side. Then I'm gonna go ahead and get the other side knocked out off camera just because that did take a long time. It actually maxed out my time lapse doing those e-brake shoes. So let's get the other side knocked out off camera and then let's drop this thing on the ground and see if one inch was enough. Cause an inch is like a lot, right? That's like above average. Let me know in the comments. What do you guys think? Before we get to dropping this thing on the ground though, I just want to show you guys the piece that makes these e-brake shoes a pain in the ass. On the main e-brake shoe that the spring actually pulls when you pull your e-brake inside of the car, it has a little pin that goes through, has a little horseshoe pin that locks it with a wave washer underneath. First of all, getting that horseshoe pin off is absolute hell. And then once you get this e-brake shoe actually separated, I had to take a punch and a hammer and bang the absolute shit out of it. And had to squeeze the old e-brake shoe in a vise. And then to get that pin back into the new e-brake shoe wasn't as bad, but I still had to use a punch and a hammer to hammer it in. It took me like 10 minutes just to get it out. Like it was rusted and seized in there. You gotta be kidding me. I'm an idiot sometimes. Wow, that pisses me off. This is a fake smile. I didn't look at these shoes close enough and these freaking things have the pins in two of them. I pressed the old pin out of the old e-brake shoe and installed it onto one of the other e-brake shoes. I am so mad at my Myself right now and I am not taking the other side back apart because these e-brake shoes are all identical the only difference is that pin and if these have the pin pre-installed I'm just gonna pound it out of one of these you guys have no idea how easy that was to swap this one over when I actually do it properly with the pin already installed in the shoe now these shoes can go back together but you already know what's gonna happen to this pin fuck that pin We got like two fingers, perfect, out of one inch. Let's go see what the other side is. Not two fingers, we got one finger and a bit on the other side. Bounce it a little bit. Ooh, a little bit 
less than two fingers now. The right height is a little bit off kind of on all four corners. I want about a two finger gap between the tire and the fender all the way around the car. So right now you can see on our left rear, this is the one we're the closest on. I can get two fingers in there, but I gotta angle my fingers up. I want it to be a straight two finger gap. Just because this is a winter beater, all it's gonna see is snow. So I don't want this thing to be slammed to the ground and then I'm gonna be digging snow out of the quarter panels and in the fender liners because it's like minus 30 outside right now. So that snow gets hard real fast and it sucks to dig out. So I took some measurements all the way around the car. My top measurement here is the gap between lock collar to lock collar. In the rear, they're both at four inches. In the front, they're both at 2.2 inches. Then W to F basically means my wheel to fender gap. So on the right rear, we have three and a half inches. Left rear is 3.8 inches. Right front is 3.7 and left front is 3.6, which is all relatively close. That shouldn't even be noticeable when looking at the car. So I think my measurements are a little bit whack. So we're just gonna eyeball this. In the front right now on the left front we got like a finger gap over here and because this car does have a little bit of positive caster in the front here I can't even get a finger in so we're gonna raise the front up about an inch because on the right front we got a one finger gap solid I can fit my finger in there the whole way so on this side I'm gonna try raising it a half an inch on the left front I'm gonna do an inch and then in the back here because I have a two finger gap almost I think I'm gonna do a quarter of an inch on the left rear and then on the right rear since I only have a one finger gap we're gonna probably do about three quarters quarters of an inch on this one or a full inch depending what we need. Setting coil over ride height is so tedious to me. I don't know if it's just me. Let me know what you guys do in the comments. Are you the type of person to just not even adjust them, slap them in and drive it like a dummy? Or does it take you absolutely forever to get your coil over ride height dialed in and have it perfect on all four corners? Cause that's how I am, which I probably shouldn't be because this is a beater. But if I'm gonna do a wheel alignment on this thing, I only wanna do it once and I wanna have the ride height completely dialed in. So let's get this knocked out. Our ride height is finally dialed and I'm happy with how she sits. On my little measurement sheet here, don't mind that I have the writing of a two year old. The right rear, I went up one inch. Between lock collars is five inches. The left rear, I went down a quarter of an inch. Between the lock collars is 3.75 inches. On the right front, I went up half an inch, 2.7 inches between lock collars. And then the left front, I went up an inch and it's 3.2 inches between lock collars. And this is how she sits. Good old ride height of a winter beater. We'll be able to fit lots of snow in there. And I got about two fingers on all four corners. So now that we got the coils completely dialed, let's fix those two coolant leaks. Hopefully we can get out that bottom coolant line. Well, let's start with the top coolant line. All I'm gonna do to fix these is just slide the little spring clamp off the coolant line and then I'm gonna slide a worm clamp onto it and hopefully that fixes the leaks. I can tell that the spring clamp is not clamping the hose down enough. So it's getting a little bit of coolant shooting past the clamp. So if we squeeze it with a worm clamp, she should be fixed. All right, I wanted to show you guys this coolant leak real quick, just so you can see where it is and how shitty of a spot it is to get at. I already fixed the one on the backside of the turbo, so we'll start the car, let it run for a bit, see if that one leaks overnight. But this one, you guys can see the coolant on those two water pump hoses right there. It's actually the smaller hose there. You can't really see on camera, but it's that hose clamp right there is not squeezing that hose enough to seal it. This is a really bad spot to get at because the front timing cover's already on. Let's see what we can do. finally got a hose clamp on there. I didn't have the proper size hose clamp, so I put one on there that is a little bit too big, but the threaded part of it isn't touching the block, so it shouldn't rattle around or anything like that. And it's nice and tight, so she shouldn't leak. I sprayed everything off with water down here, and I squeegeed up all the water and coolant that was on the floor. And we did lose a little bit of coolant from popping that water pump hose off, so I might have to top it up a bit and bleed it again. But I'm gonna get this thing on the ground now, run it for a bit, and then I'm gonna leave it overnight and see if we got any coolant on the ground tomorrow. Oh my god! <laughs> and that's why you're not supposed to jack your car up on a grate.
thing runs so quiet. There's not a single tick in this engine. Oh, she looks like such a good beater now that the ride height's set. We are so close to being done this thing. All right, like I said, I'm gonna let this run a little bit longer and then we'll come back to this tomorrow and see if we got any leaks. Because it's already 12.30 and I gotta wake up at 4.45 for work. Fun. It is the next day now. And as you guys can see, I got everything pulled out of that dash that I picked up that I need to swap into this car. And we also got the sub ground wire and power wire pulled out of the car. And that little hood latch wire that was here is gone too because the remote start doesn't work. I don't have a remote, so I just pulled it out from the engine base so I don't have wires hanging everywhere and zip tied it up underneath the dash. So the reason I took the harness out of this car is because I just looked inside of the car and where we wanna install this clock on the dash, Here's the wires for the clock. They just completely snipped them instead of just disconnecting the connector and letting the connector sit in there. They cut them off. So whoever did that, I don't like you. This is also the rat's nest of wiring behind here that I wanna pull out. I'm gonna pull all those wires completely out of the car, disconnect them from whatever he has them tapped into, and we're gonna just install the factory clock piece. And it's a good thing I kept the harness because those wires are cut, which sucks. Because now I need to cut this connector off of this harness and then solder those wires on here and match up all the wire colors. Also, I'm not swapping the gauge cluster out to get a lower mileage in this car or anything like that. I'm not that kind of guy. This cluster does have 200 and some thousand kilometers on it. This cluster has over 300,000 kilometers on it. All I'm using this for is I'm gonna plug it into the car and make sure that all of the bulbs work in the back of it. And then if they do, I'm just gonna take the bulbs out of the back of this one and then we're gonna swap them into mine, which is easy. They're just all those little twist tabs on the back there. So let's get that knocked out. And then the last thing that I have to do, I think, is put the stock intake in and test the other right front seat that I have to make sure the heated seat works. And then this car's done, other than the AFR sensor. She's almost ready to be a beater, boys. I'm wondering if the hella horns off the STI fit on the WRX. And I think they freaking do. Sick, boys. Let's just twist these together and make sure that this works first. Oh yeah, they work. installed baby All right now that we got the hella horns completely installed and the whole front end of the car is put together I'm jumping back into this video like a couple days later because we had a real big shipment show up for the Civic, which will be next video. You guys can probably already guess what it is if you follow my Instagram, because we've been talking about it for a while. We got a lot of parts. So last thing I wanna do on the WRX in this video, I'm not gonna get the intake swapped out because I gotta drill out the holes and it's gonna take forever and I wanna freaking drive this thing. But I can't drive it because it's minus 35 outside and I need a block heater or else she ain't gonna start if I leave it outside. So since I took all of the heat shields off the exhaust manifold on this thing, I just built a custom little block heater harness. 
This is actually the heat sleeving from my IEG AOS that I did not use on the STI. So I just put some zip ties on there and heat sleeved where it's gonna be near the manifold. So now we're gonna get the front end of this car jacked up, or actually I'll probably just jack up one side, crawl under there, get this block heater plugged in, and then we'll zip tie the harness nice and secure. And hopefully I can get it to come out at the bottom of the front bumper there so that it's nice and easy to just plug in. And I don't have to pop the hood every time. That actually turned out pretty good. Because the cord was pretty long, I ran it along the frame rail there, and it comes out on that side, which is kind of right in the middle of the front bumper, which is nice and easy to get to to plug in. Then I ran it around the AC condenser. It comes out and zip ties to the fan shroud there, and then the heat wrap starts, goes over the manifold, and it's folded up right here and plugs into the block right there, which is perfect. Now we got a block heater. She's officially winter ready. I got one more thing that I want to do in this video. Okay, we got them all off, but there's so much sticky shit on the window. I'm gonna try hitting it with some glass cleaner and then scraping it all off. Usually this works pretty good. Here we go, no more 10 horsepower stickers on the back window. She's looking nice and clean now. All right, that is where I'm gonna end this video today, boys. We got a lot done. The WX is ready for the road. I'm probably gonna drive it before we swap this stock intake back in, just cause I wanna drive it once and hear some cool turbo noises. So next video on the WX is gonna be a first drive video and I'm excited. Here's a sneak peek at the next video for the Civic and that's all you guys get. We got so many big things on the go with this channel. Peace out you guys, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.